Hello students, um, how are you doing? Okay, so today we're going to be looking at networks and the effect of using them. And um, in this course, I'll be showing you the key things you need to probably concentrate as you prepare for your examination. Okay, um, now most computer systems are now connected in some ways to form a network. Okay, now this ranges from a basic home computer of only a few devices to a very large network. Now, every computer appliances you see at home are connected in some ways, okay? And um, it can reach from a few to a very large, okay? The whole essence, the whole essence of why we set it up is to share the resources. A good example could be uh, printers or even your softwares. Okay, even the internet itself. Okay, so let's look at those common um, network terms. Okay, so let's start with the network interface card. Now, when we talk about network interface card, they are needed to allow a device to connect to a network. That's what it does. A device that is needed, right, to allow to connect to a network. So, every computer, be it a laptop, um, a desktop, has a network interface card and the whole essence of what it's doing is to allow that particular device to connect to a network okay now another thing you need to know is uh, we also have wireless network interface card okay and they are also used to connect devices to the internet or also to other networks okay and however they use wireless connectivity utilizing what we call an antenna to communicate with network by microwave, they are usually plugged into the USB port or to be part of the internal integrated circuit. That simply means that when your probably your your NIC is bad in your laptop, you could actually get the external one. Okay, yeah. Okay, the next one is the media access control, which is the MAC address. Now, the MAC address is the address that is found on the network interface card okay and it's a number which uniquely identifies a device when it is connected to a network it is what identifies that device when it's connected and it's made up of 48 bits and they are shown in six groups so there are eight of them we have um eight groups we have one two three four five six right six groups so there are eight in each of them okay with um uh, with a general format here we have the manufacturer code and we have the device serial number. So the NNN is for the manufacturing code and then the three for the manufacturing code, the three for the device serial number. Okay. Now the MAC address is sometimes referred to as the physical address because it uniquely identifies a device. Okay. Now MAC address are useful when trying to what, identify network faults. Because they never change. It's, it's different from the IP. I'm going to look at it in, in a jiffy. It's different from the IP because they never change, right? Which makes it a more reliable method of identifying the data sender and data receiver in the network. The next one is the internet protocol address. Mm. Now, in the internet protocol address, okay, whenever a computer connects to the internet, Whenever, whenever your laptop, you can see my laptop is connected, right? It is giving an IP address. If an IP, an address is being assigned to that device. Now, this is usually assigned to the computer by the internet service provider because the operation of the internet is based on a set of rules. That's protocol. Okay, so it is necessary to supply an IP address. So that's just what it has. So anytime your computer is connected, it is given an, an, an IP address, right? The internet protocol defines that rule that must be agreed by the sender and receiver of data communicating to the internet. So an IP address identifies the location of a device on a network. Okay, now this simply means that if you're using a laptop at home, you have been given an IP address when connected to the internet. Yeah. 
if you're using um, your laptop home, you have an IP address when you connect your to the internet. If you take the laptop to the coffee shop, you log into the internet again, you get assigned a new IP address. Unlike the MAC address that remain constant, the IP address changes each time you log into um, an internet in a different location or to a network in a different location. And then there are two versions of the IP. We have IPv4 and IPv6. The IPv4 is based on 32 bits, okay, and the address is written in four groups of eight bits. Okay, so 32 bits, four group of eight bits. Now, um, why uh, the IP4 uses what we call a one to eight bit address? Okay, the, uh, IP4 is 32, IP6 is one to eight, and it takes the form of eight groups. Okay, of hex digits. Okay, so we have an example like this, right? So usually the one we use is the IPv4. Okay, data packet. Now, data is moved around the network, and they are moved in that form of what we call data packet. So, whenever a user is sending some data, it will split it up into a number of packets. Now, each of those packets are what transmitted separately. Okay, so the packet of data we usually have what we call a header, which contains one. The sender IP address, the receiver IP address, identity number of the packet, the packet size, how many data packets can make up the whole message. So all this, there's the the sender IP, there's the receiver IP, there's the identity number of the packet, um, there's the packet size, right, which is more or less to ensure that you are receiving, to ensure the receiving station can check if all of the packets have arrived in that. Now, what happened? Just a quick one. When the router right, receives a packet of data, it checks the destination IP address against the one stored in the routing table, which allows the router to determine the packet next step in the path. Now, the third packet will pass through a number of routers before it reaches a final destination. Okay, all information in the data package allow um, all information in the packet data header allow the package to be reassembled in the correct order. Now, a video of this has been sent, and we did a, a question came up on this, and we talked about it. You can check it up in um, the videos on past people's in people one, and you see it right there. Hops, hops are hardware device. That's the first one. That can have the numbers of other devices connected to them. Now, the whole essence of the hub is that they're primarily used to connect devices together to form what we call a local area network, usually in the same building. Okay? But this is one special thing about the hub. Whenever a data package is sent to the hub at one of its ports, it will broadcast it to every devices that are connected to it, whether it's intended for it or not. But switches, they are the intelligent version of hops. The same thing with the hops, they connect number of devices to form a land. But unlike the hop, the switch stores the MAC address of all devices on the computer, on the network. So each port on the switch connected to a device, we have a matching MAC address called the lookup table, right? So you can see port one, this is it, port two, this is it, port three, this is it, port four, this is it, port five, etc., etc. Now, this is the diagram for it. Now, Let's talk about. We've seen lookup table. Now let's talk about using the lookup table. Now what happens is, whenever a data package is sent, a switch is going to match the MAC address. We've talked about the MAC address. That is the address that comes with your network interface card, right? Or an incoming data, right? Around the port. 
it will not direct it to the current device. This simply means that none of the other, other devices will see this data packet. So if a data packet arrives in port 2, the MAC address is going to be what? The MAC address, if it's in port 2, is going to be this. And so on and so forth. The MAC address, if the MAC address in the data package is this, right, then it will switch. Then the switch will connect the data package to port 4 only. Okay. Now, in summary, let's look at this. Both hubs and switch are used to want to connect device in the network. That's a similarity. They both use data package. That's also a similarity. Hubs will send data package to every device in the network. Switch will send data package to a specific device. Now, that's, a, that's what the difference between the hub and, of course, the switch. In terms of the switch, um, security is more higher than the hubs. And the switch has a lookup table that determines the destination of the device. A switch in there also uses what we call a MAC address to locate what the destination device. Now, the next one is what bridges. Let's talk about bridges. Bridges are devices that connect one device to another land. I'm going to explain this. I know bridges are a little bit tricky, but I'll explain it. Stay with me. So, there are devices that connect one land to another land that uses the same protocol or communication. Now, in essence, a bridge is often used to connect together different parts of your local area network so that they function as a single land. Now, these are computers, right? They are connected to what? A switch. It's connected to a switch or hub, whichever one. Now we have a server. Now these are the ISPs. Now, the bridge now will now connect these two of them and it will see it as what a single LAN. So if there should be a router here, the router is now going to connect the bridge to the internet. Okay? Now, unlike writers, bridges cannot communicate with external network. What are the external networks? Your internet. And this is where the router comes in. Because for routers, they route those data package from one network to another network based on the IP addresses, okay? And this can do this. Now watch this. This can do this using each router here. So each router here has its own word, IP address, right? So what happens is this, okay? And I know this is tricky and I want to explain this, okay? So we have computers here, computer here, computer here. You have the switch here. Now, all these are connected to this. We're not talking about which one is dummy, which one is smart. Although this, your hubs and your switch, they help to connect your computers, right? And then we have the server. But this is where, and all this forms what we call local area network because they are within the building, right? But this is where it gets dicey. Because now, the router is what helps to be able to what, join that LAN toward the internet, right? So what, when you see a network connected to the internet, this is, this is possible with the router. And don't forget, all these are hardware devices. You can see a picture of this right here. This is a picture of this right here. So now what happens is that once this is connected, now the switch here is now connected to here. Okay, so we could, we have one, two, three, four, four ports. Okay, that each of these can be connected to. So what we are simply saying is, when it comes to the router, right, they help us to be able to route data packets from one network to a network, another network. And this is simply based on the fact that is on the IP address. Of course, we talked about the IP address, which is the internet protocol that changes anytime we're in a different location and we connect to the internet. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Now, 
let's just dive a bit about it because I just want to explain all this you see when you actually read your test book. Now, it says here that when a data package is received at one end of its port, now the router is going to inspect the IP address and now it's going to determine whether the data package is meant for its own network or for another network. In that case, is it an external network? Okay, is it, are you are you saying uh, the router is like okay? You want me to connect to the internet? And that's the most time when there is no internet, it shows you are connected. It really means that the network is connected, but does not have access to the external network. Okay, now, now if it's meant for its own network, then the data package is then routed toward a local switch or hub. Okay. All right. I know it's, it's not easy when it comes to networks, but as much as possible, I'm trying to explain all this. Now, um, let's look at this, right? So all these are computers, all these are computers. And each of these computers is connected to what? To a hub or a switch. And this is what helps you to be able to form a network, to share resources, okay? now. This is the same thing, computers connected to the network, computers connected to the network, and this is a switch, a switch, a switch, a switch. Now, all these are what we call your routers, okay, your routers. So you can see that this is S for switch, C for computers, right? So it's a cool application, okay? So now each of them are being linked with the router. Now. It now determines if you're connecting to an external network or if it's going to be an internal network. Okay? All right. And there is a description here that talks about how this is possible. You can see that data package are sent from C1 to what? R1. Now, this is C1. C1. C1 here sent to the switch and then sent to R1. Then again, the hour now checks the IP address and knows the data package are not intended for any device on network one. The data package will then forward on toward the internet. What hour? Where is the hour here? Right, the hour. And then what happens again? The IP address, right, which is the header of the data package, will now match that of what hour four. And you can see hour four is what right there okay and it goes on and on and the alpha will now recognize the ip address of each of the data package referred to network 4 and, and then forward it towards to the s4 which should direct each data package to c10 okay and it goes on and on now usually there are questions being asked about the comparisons of routers and bridges We'll talk about the comparisons, but we are comparing them, looking at um, similarities and then differences as much as possible. We were talking about the comparing and constructing. Now, let's look at let's talk of, let's look at routers. Now, for routers, the main objective of a router is to connect various types of networks together. That's for router, right? So they are connecting various types of what network together. Now, for the bridge. The main objective of a bridge is to connect lands together. Connect multiple lands to function as what a single land. For router, the router the router scans a device IP address. But for bridge, it scans a device MAC address. Another one is data is sent out using data packet. And it's for bridge is also sent out using data packet. Because there are questions that will come that talk about comparing and constructing. Okay, for in the case of the router, you can connect network. Connected network we use what different protocols. And that's true. But for bridge, it has to be the same protocol. Now we use a routing table to direct data to the current device. Because if your network is coming, you want to ensure that this is going to the right to the right um, switch. Bridge or data, they don't need to use the routing table. Remember, a bridge is just to combine and um, to connect multiple lands to function as a single land. 
Now, a router has more than two ports. A bridge has only two ports. Um, I think there's a picture here. Okay. Okay, I think that should be in the back or something. Um, let me see if I can get a picture to show you bridge computer network. Okay. Let me get a picture to show you bridge. Okay, so this is a good example of uh, a bridge right here. This is a bridge right here. Uh, this is also a bridge. So you can see that with the number of ports it has, just two ports. Okay. Okay, let's talk about Wi Fi and Bluetooth. So let's talk about Wi Fi, right? Now, when we talk about Wi Fi and Bluetooth, the first thing that comes to mind is both of them are wireless communication between devices. For example, you want to send a file, you tell somebody on your Bluetooth, you want to send you a file, the person has to call the Bluetooth, and then you can now send that file to the person, right? You have to pair. In that case, you have to pair, right? The devices have to be paired, and then connections can then be sent, right? So they, both of them, both the Wi-Fi, which is the wireless fidelity, and then the Bluetooth offer what we call the wireless communication between the devices. Now, they, they both uses electromagnetic radiation as a carrier of the data transmission, okay? Now, let's, I'm just going to talk about the key things about the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth, which is very, very essential. You don't have to, um, really put all energy in all the text, right? Now, what, what are Bluetooth useful for, right? Bluetooth is useful for, I think Bluetooth uses an encryption key called the secured uh, personal area network, your, your white pad, right? W pad. Now, um, Bluetooth is useful for transferring data between two or more devices which are close together. Okay, so they are usually less than 30 meters distance. So it means that if you're far from each other, you might not actually get to. Um, if two things are happening, right, the far you are, the more slower the connection is. Um, so it's they are just within less than 30 meters. If you're out of range, then probably you're going to lose connection. Okay, all right. Now, with the speed of data transmission. When the speed of data transmission is not critical, it's useful when the speed of transmission is not critical. It's not something that you're not transferring something very, very high. Okay. For low bandwidth applications, for example, when you're sending music files from your mobile phone to a headset, for example. Okay. Now, for Wi Fi, the send and receive video waves in several different frequency bands, like 2.4 and 5 gigahertz which are the most common at the moment okay now um each band is also for that split into channels right so we have the 2.4 we have 5 gigahertz right and of course the 5 gigahertz are the more faster data transfer rate okay but a shorter signal reach okay now what are, when are wi are useful yeah useful when it's best suited to operate a full scale network, right? Because it offers a much faster data transfer rate, better range, better security than even Bluetooth. Okay. Okay, let's quickly just dive into the the features between the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi. For transmission frequency use, for Bluetooth you have 2.4 gigahertz for wi-fi you're having 2.4 um, and then 5.0 gigahertz there's even 3.6 but usually it's, it's within 2.4 and 5.0 gigahertz okay now the next one is the data transfer rate for data transfer rate of bluetooth we have 25 megabits per second but for the wi-fi you have 250 megabits per second then for that's the data transfer rate. 
Another you have to look at is the maximum effective range. The range between the Bluetooth is less than 30 meters. For Wi-Fi, okay, um, you have within the range of 100 meters. Although, it can be obstructed by walls. Now, if you have a concrete wall in your office, at home, and the wall is very thick, that can actually obstruct the signals, okay, from um, passing through. Okay, so you need to know that. Okay, so therefore is is um therefore reducing that um, effective range just to a few meters. Okay, for maximum connection, Bluetooth is up to seven devices. I think five. Okay, I've seen three. I've seen four. They might not be up to seven, right? But might not be up to seven. But for Wi-Fi, it depends on your router. Okay, it depends on your router right so as much as possible when you are connected to the internet depends on your router all right types of data transmission security now for bluetooth they use a key matching encryption okay now what do i mean key matching encryption now what you want to pair in bluetooth i know you've seen this if you want to pair they're going to send you a key and you also they will send the sender a key send the receiver a key now, both of you will have to click on pair. So if I click on pair, I will have to wait on you to click on that same key to pair before a connection can be established. But for a Wi-Fi, we have what we call the Wi-Fi protected um, asset, which is WPA. So that simply means that if you want to connect to your Wi-Fi, you have to put the password that has been assigned for that network for you to con for you to actually continue. Okay. All right, and the next one, I think that's the final one, is um, cloud computing. Now, I'm going to talk about cloud computing. Now, questions can come out from cloud computing, right? Because it's the future, really, right? Now, we'll talk about cloud computing or more um, appropriately, cloud storage. Okay, so what are those cloud storage? Your Google Drive, OneDrive, iCloud, Dropbox. Okay, and there, there are also other, you know, other cloud storage that are not. I think these are the most common cloud storage that you know, and at least is popular in the market, right? Because of their companies, for Microsoft, they make use of OneDrive, for Google. They make use of Google Drive for Apple. They make use of iCloud, right? Now, when we'll talk about cloud computing, is a method of data storage where data is stored on remote server. Of course, there are thousands of servers in many different locations. Now, the same data is stored in more than one server. Okay, in case of a maintenance or repair, so it simply means that. Whenever you are uploading your data to Google Drive, yes, you are seeing it on Google Drive, but there are so many servers that file is in case they want to carry out a maintenance, in case there is a damage, and these servers are linked together. And another beauty thing, uh, another another beauty about the cloud storage is clients can be able to access their data at any time. In fact, literally, you don't need, you don't need to use the same laptop. You can upload to your Google Drive and you can use somebody else's laptop to assess that particular information you have uploaded. All you have to do is to log in to that cloud storage and then you have access to that information. Okay? Now, although this is not a data redundancy because we are having these information stretched in in various servers. Okay? Now, the physical environment of the cloud storage is owned and managed by hosting companies. And I've mentioned these companies. You have Apple, you have Microsoft, you have Google. Okay? Now, there are three common cloud storage systems. Although we have not seen questions on this, but in this new syllabus, you might be expecting questions on that. We have public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid cloud. Let me talk about them. Now, public cloud, this is a storage environment where the customer and clients and cloud storage providers are different companies. Okay, different companies. I can be working in Amazon 
and I can have my information on Google. It's a public cloud. Okay, I'm right here in Nigeria and I can upload my cloud to Google. As long as the public cloud is a free cloud, public cloud about free, it's accessible. You don't have to buy it. Like when I mean buy it, that it comes free, right? It's accessible. Although you pay for an upgrade, but it's accessible. You, all you have to do is just type to drive.google.com and then you type of OneDrive, iCloud, and you can access this information. Then we have private cloud. Private cloud. This is a storage provided by a dedicated environment behind the company firewall. This simply means that customers, clients, and cloud storage providers are integrated and operate as a single entity. Now, for you to be able to access iCloud, you must have either an Apple device, but I mean Apple device, either using an iPhone or a Macintosh or a MacBook, because it's, it strictly operates on their products. I think the same thing as OneDrive. Okay, but the likes of Google Drive, Dropbox, they are public clouds. Okay, you don't have to use an Android device. You can use anything. If you're using the Macintosh, you can still upload your, your files to the Google Drive because it's a public cloud. Then we have hybrid cloud. This is a combination of two previous environments, which is both public and both private. Some data resides in the private cloud, and there are less sensitive and less commercial data can be accessed from a public cloud storage provider. Google Drive is both hybrid. I call Google Drive a hybrid cloud because it gives privilege for public and also private. Okay, I need to make that very very clear. Now let's talk about advantages of cloud storage. Now, one of the advantages of cloud storage is for cloud storage, your information can be accessed at any time for many devices anywhere in the world. If you're uploading in Nigeria, you can be in Canada, you access that device. You can access that, access that piece of information. It's not restricted to any geographic region. Okay? As long as there's internet access. So this is cloud storage. Cloud storage means you're uploading to to somewhere else server okay so you need an internet connection to upload and also to access if you don't have internet connection you cannot access google drive that's the truth and another key another good advantage about the cloud storage is there is no need for a customer to carry external storage devices with them you don't need to carry external hard drive i'm what you know you can just put it on the cloud storage okay Okay, or even use the same computer to store and retrieve your information. There's no need for that. Once you put your information, you can access them anywhere. Now, the cloud also provides users with what we call remote backup of data. In case there's a disaster, in case there's a data lost, you can actually recover those things into your computer should you get a new one. And that's where the iCloud comes in. Okay, I think the Android also devices have also integrated that as well. So even if you lose your device, for, for, for instance, if you lose your iPhone, you can easily get those information just by logging into your iCloud account and all those things will be uploaded to your new device. It's that simple. Okay, now if a customer or a client has a failure of their hard disks or even the backup device, Cloud storage will always allow recovery of their data. Okay? Which is also another cool advantage. Now, the cloud system offers almost unlimited. I, I'm careful with that word, unlimited. You can get an unlimited storage, but it comes at a price. <laughs> okay? It's not free. <laughs> they will just, or you want unlimited, you just give it. It's not free. You have to pay for it but that's a good thing literally because i can store as many information as i want to store and i don't have to bother myself about oh it's getting filled up 
okay unlike our normal um fixed hard drive or portable hard drive okay now let's talk about disadvantages of cloud computing now for disadvantages of cloud computing security aspect okay security aspect of storing data in the cloud security aspect talks about your information can be hacked yeah as long as it's the internet it's not 100 percent secured people can get access to your login details and they can get access to those files so why we look at the advantages the beauty of having a cloud storage we also have to look at the downsides people can actually access those information without your permission and that's what hacking is gaining unauthorized access to what either your computers or your personal information unauthorized so they don't have your or the formal authorization they're using the backend to do that now if a customer or a client has a slow or unstable internet connection they could have issues accessing or downloading their data so it means you need to have a stable internet connection okay then again we have to look at the cost if you want to get a larger capacity okay um you have to pay for it so the cost can be high if a large storage capacity or a high download data is required so, and also you need to know this we are not we are not eliminating the fact that there could be a potential failure of the cloud storage company who could crash okay which is okay i know i know most of you are saying it's nearly impossible i know but it's not possible we have to look at the realization and as a student you have an exam on friday right and they're asking you disadvantage of cloud storage cloud computing that should not be far-fetched you will have to put that into question because there is that we there's there, there is that there's it there, there is that possibility right that it could happen even though they have a very tight security there's that possibility so you have to put it down right your examiners are going to mark you they're not going to mark you down it's, it's possible as long as this is the internet world anything is possible okay so and then you can have a loss of tobacco not just you but millions of people as well okay all right i think those are the um the issues of when it comes to um when it comes to um cloud storage so that those are the key things um the types of cloud which we've looked at very very important so please um it's very important the three common cloud storage systems advantages and advantage of the cloud and that's all the next thing is common network environments we'll look at our extranet intranet and what the internet although we are going to come back to this in chapter 10 we'll talk about it in depth in chapter 10 but let's talk about network types we have three types of networks look at your network wireless look at your network and the wide area net the wide area network the metropolitan area network is not part of the scope you see it in computer science this is ict it's ICC, ict right you see it in ITCC computer science but this is just what it is just the three of them now for local area network lan they are within a building or a geographical uh, they are geographically near to each other a good example in the relation i'm working currently working we have a LAN we have a network okay now a typical LAN consists of numbers of computers and devices what are the devices for example printers okay that's if we're using that banks they do it and these are connected to hubs these are connected to what switches and we've looked at hubs, we've looked at switches, and we said switches is what is the intelligent version of what a hub. And one of the hubs of switches will usually be connected to a router to allow the LAN to what to connect to the internet. Okay, now let's talk about the advantages. Okay, of networking these computers using the local area network. Okay for one they allow sharing of resources 
ok? Ya la shen of resources. What are those resources they are sharing? They are either sharing your hardware. And a good example of your hardware could be printers and scanners. Now, if you go to banks, watch this. If you go to banks, I want to explain this in terms of, If you go to banks, you will see that they have just one, one printer. Okay? Now, this printer they are having. Okay, this printer they are having. Now, you see that all computers are connected to that printer. And the whole essence of this is so that you are able to share resources. Because it will be it will be more costly to buy printers for each laptop. So you could actually buy one printer, connect the laptops to the printer, and then you can actually send files to it. Although, whenever if one laptop is sending um if, if a document to the printer for printing, and another one is sending, the other one has to be on queue. Okay? And not only that, if it's also if they're also connected. You can be able to right share softwares like what processors photo editing softwares okay now they permit easy communication right they permit easy communication between users of the land yeah Okay, so that's another good advantage. They permit what they that easy communication between the land by using simple text messaging between the computers or the network. Now they use a network administrator to ensure security and the use of land is constantly monitored. Now that this is done by a software, a firewall, that you can actually monitor people who are actually making use of what the network to see who is who is accessing sites, who is going into this. But it's quite expensive to get it, right? Because the piece of hardware that you have to just connect um, your router to so that it acts as what a firewall. So whatever anybody is accessing, it goes in there, right? We can see it, we can disable it, we can remove the person from the network as much as possible. Disadvantage on the other hand is this. Easier spread of viruses throughout the whole network. Once you are, once you are connected to a network, is either to spread viruses. Queue for shared resources can be frustrating. Now imagine you want to print an object document, and like five five computers have five computers have already sent documents to the to the printer. It can be frustrating because you have to you have to actually wait for your own turn for the, for the um, printer to be able to print. Slower access to what external networks. You have to put that in slow access to what external networks. Increase security risks when compared to standalone computers. There's that security because computers are thrown together, so there's that um, increased security risk. Now, another thing that I want to talk about as an advantage is if the main server breaks down, right? The network will no longer function properly. There are cases that I'm talking about when you route talking to the internet. There are cases where if there's any issue with the router, you can't have access to the internet. Even though there's internet, you can't have access to it because the router is down. Okay? Uh, or to our ISPs, when their base stations are down. You can't have access. So it's connected, but you're not browsing. Okay? And that, that's its advantage as well. Hmm. Now, the one we are talking about is the lab. Now, that LAN uses what we call a Awu J47. It's a registered JAL47 cable. I think for my laptop, I have it here. Okay, I don't think I have it here in my laptop. But there are some laptops, right? Old laptops that have it. Um, let me show you a picture of the Awu J47. Awu J45, sorry. Awu J45 connectors. Let me show you how it looks like. This is how it looks like. Okay, so. If you check this, just to show you how it looks like, so this is a good example of what I'm talking about. Now, if you check your computers, laptops, you're going to see that there is, let me check, laptops with internet, internet port. We call them an internet port. This is a good example of what I'm talking about. Internet port. Just want to show you. 
Okay, I've seen one here. Um, I want a closer view of the internet port. I've seen one. Okay, I don't know if this is clear, but let me use this. Now, if you watch this, this is a good example of the internet port right here. And this, this is a Lenovo laptop. This is a Lenovo laptop. So it's right here. Okay, you see it's right here. Let me find. Okay, this is another one as well. And, um, Okay, good. This is the day. I think this is the perfect one I'm looking for. Good. Now the average the average of five connector is actually connected to the internet port. This is a good one. Okay, you can see that. Can you see this? So this is now connected. Okay, the average of forty five is now connected to what the internet port. This one is your VGA. So I don't want to, So this laptop has two. Has two internet ports, right? There are some that has one. Okay, some laptop has one. So it's fine. Okay. All right. Just wanted to show you that okay now but for the wireless okay for the wireless there is no need for that okay there are no wires there are no cables because they are wireless network communication they use what we call radio or radio for us we use the radio signal that's all they use infrared okay so if you check here i'm connected wirelessly right you can see i'm connected to a network right connected to it so there is no internet cable that is plugged on it now if it is plugged on it you are going to see a sign that shows let me see if i can draw it um something like this um i think like um i think something like this not really sure but it, it goes like yeah, yeah. So, so think something like this, right? It is, oh, this one is for the Wi-Fi, right? It is for the wireless. But if it's the one that's connected, right, you see it something like this. Okay, so okay. Now, now these devices are known as what we call access points. Okay. Now the access points are what you have placed on each of um for my school for example they are placed in each um designated areas okay now in one building in one um floor we can have like two access points although it's not enough but then again it can still serve you place it on areas right so that you can be able to assess it okay so that access point the one gives you access to what that internet and it's sending it's sending the feedback to what to your switch right and then the router is now doing the job now they are connected to what we call a wired network at fixed locations now because of the limited range most commercial lands need several aps to permit uninterrupted what wireless connection so just one will not be enough that means you have to connect a lot of them at least at if you if you're a two-story building at least you'll be able to have um if you have like four floors or four rooms okay at least three in each in each floor three 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 okay and that's fine right three 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 and that should be able to serve okay so you have it one here one here one here and that's fine but then again i talked about your walls if your walls are thick walls then you might experience some what interruptions okay okay now this, this is what i'm talking about so watch this now the aap receives and transmit data between the wlan and the wired network structures. Now, end users access the wired LAN towards the LAN adapters which are built into their system. Okay, now you have an access point here, you have an access point here, you have an access point here. Now, this access point is serving this computer, this access point is serving this computer, this access point is serving this computer, and they are all connected to what? To the router. Can you see that? 
let's talk about differences between the wireless networking uh, the wireless local area network and the uh, local area network which is what uh, we call them wired networking you tell me that's wireless networking wired networking okay now for wireless it's easier to expand the network right because you are not connecting using cables for the wireless on the other hand it produces a more reliable and stable network because it is wired right it is whatever is whatever network is um, flowing from your um from the router is going direct it's a dedicated network but for the wireless um your walls wind a lot of factors can actually dampen what the network and they are subjected to what uh, interference now this device on the other hand increase mobility so you can actually move around as long as you have as long as you're within the range of what the APs, which is your access points. Okay. But for the wired, data transfer it tends to be very, very fast. Because there will be no there will be do not there will be no dead spot. Okay, but another difference is that you cannot move it around, it's wired now. So you have to stick, you have to be within that wired connection. Although for the wireless, there's no cabling around. Okay, so there is that safety improvement and it increased what flexibility. Okay, now there is an increased chance of interference from external sources. Okay, there is increased chance of interference because it's wireless. Your walls act as, uh, as interference, um, the wind, a lot of factors could actually affect it. But for wired, to set it up is cheaper, right? But you need to buy and install uh, more cables if you really want to expand or something like that, right? Okay. And one last one, data is less secured than the wireless because it is easier to intercept radio waves and microwaves and cable, okay? So you protect it using what? Encryption. For the wireless, don't password now. It's just once you plug it direct, you are connected. For the wireless, you need you need password oh, because it's easy to intercept. Anybody that can intercept the network can actually connect to it. And if anybody knows the password, they can actually connect to your network. But for the wired, okay, the cable network lose the ability for devices to be mobile. You cannot carry it around. So you have to be close enough to allow for your cable connection, okay? And mind you, not um, not every laptops have that um, internet port. So for my laptop, I will have to get the um, the converter, the USB to internet um, to internet port converter, where I can plug in my USB, okay? I can plug in my USB and then plug in what the internet, the uh, the RJ45. Um, um, into what my internet port okay so that works wide area network okay now computers and network are situated in very long distance from each other okay and this okay i'm just looking for something now we'll talk about the wireless area network, the wide area network, rather, we're talking about the internet. Okay, so the one usually makes use of what? Public communication, such as telephone lines or satellite. They can also use dedicated or least communication lines, which can be less expensive and also more secure, less risk of hacking. So you can be able to access this network from more anywhere. Okay, from anywhere. Now, we talked about that numbers of LAN are joined together using a router and then that router will now connect to what we call a wide area network. So for one, you, it, can, it can span across 100 kilometers to even 1,000 kilometers. Um, for LAN, it's just between 10 meters to 1,000 meters, to just at least within the range of 1 kilometer. Okay.
security issues regarding these actual files okay we'll talk about it in chapter eight it's fine i think i've talked about it it's right here you could actually see content of it and um get yourself a uh, best with it then passwords i've also talked about passwords but we use passwords for assessing for many instances when assessing the internet if you want to if you want to assess your banking details you need a password if you want to assess your email account you need a password if you want to assess your social networking sites like your facebook your snapchat your tiktok you need a password so you don't you can just you cannot just open your snapchat you start no, you, you need to have an account with them and you need to put in your login details and that's your password although for password you need to have a strong password and then we'll talk about it here as well as much as possible now they said in, in your test book you said there are many many more instances where you need to type in a password and in many cases a user id okay now it is important that passwords are protected using a strong password is important now what do we do run anti-spyware softwares to make sure that your passwords are not being really bad what are anti-spywares there are software that may install your laptop they spy on you right they spy on you to check what you are doing and what happens is that it will record all your activities on your laptop and convey it back to the programmer. So that's why it's advisable to change your password on a regular basis in case it comes into possession of what? Another what? Illegal um, or by accident. Password should not be easy to crack. So use a strong password. What are strong passwords? A strong password should contain a capital letter, a numeric value, and then one special character yeah and if you check modern um, networking sites you see that that's what is big that's what is um, required for you to create your password if you could if you put just all it and they'll tell you that it's a weak password so you don't accept it anymore okay all right so let's talk about um i know this is a long one but let's talk about Let's talk about other authentication methods. Okay. Now, passwords are one of the most common type of authentication. What are authentication? Authentication simply means granting you access, authenticating to ensure that this is who this person say he is. And there are various ways to authenticate you. Password is one of them. But there are other ones. We have biometrics, your magnetic stripe, smart cards, fiscal token, electronic token even your zero logins and we're just going to look at this just the key things on them as much as possible now for zero log logins they rely on devices being smart enough to instantly recognize the user by numbers of features based on biometrics and behavioral patterns now for zero login you are not typing in anything right they can recognize you based on your biometrics and you putting in your patterns Okay, instead of using passwords, like I said, the zero login system is going to build up what a complex user based on two features biometrics, which is usually based on, um, is used on many smartphones as well of logging into your phones. You place your finger on it, okay, or your face, right? And your behavior pattern talks about how you walk, your typing speed, your normal location how you swipe the screen okay so that's zero login okay so very very important but there are certain disadvantages to this how do you how do you know when they are being monitored how do you know if and when you have been locked out how protected is it in reality but these are questions that we we, we have to ask ourselves now we have a magnetic stripe card. Now your magnetic stripe cards, cards are those cards you use in hotels, right? Uh, they also used to swipe in for payment as much as possible. Okay. Now you see those cards, right? I will also cover this in chapter chapter two. I will also look at it also in chapter six. We are talking about ICT application. I think in banking as well. Okay. Now, the stripe is read by swiping into a card reader. And once you swipe into a card reader, right, you will see that indoors, 
for doors, if you swipe it in, it will form red, it will show green. That simply means you can be able to open the door. And once you close the door again, it's going to lock. So you need your card to be able to swipe in. To be, if you go to all these big hotels, they use it as well. Okay. Okay. So data such as name, number, date of birth are all contained on that magnetic stripe. Okay. When used as security devices to allow entry to buildings. Okay. They also use holograms, which are designed to make forgery of the card more difficult. Okay, so it changes color or appear to have a moving object. Okay, as the image is viewed from different angles. Because of this, it's difficult to copy. Okay, it prevents somebody simply photocopying a card and using it illegally. What are the advantages? Let's talk about the advantages. Because in this course, we just talk about advantages and disadvantages. For the advantages, they are easy to use. It is not an expensive technology. Magnetic cards can be remotely added, uh, deactivated if lost or stolen. That's one good thing. If you've lost your card to your hotel room, simple, they will just deactivate it and get you a new one. The card can be multiple pools. That is another good thing about magnetic strike. You can use it for entering a building. You can, you can use it as a door key card. You can also use it as a card in a vending machine to buy food. Okay. Now, disadvantages is less secured, right? Okay, because it can be copied. Okay. And the card can wear out with a lot of use. If you keep using it, if you keep swiping it to wear out. Magnetic readers often fail to read what the card on what first attempt. Okay, so that's another advantage. You keep trying it again, keep trying it again. Smart cards. Now your smart cards, right? Um, usually they, they have a chip on it. Okay, so it acts as what we call a contactless card. It can be read from a distance. You don't have to swipe it to uh, a card you die. Just put it on it to just see it, okay? Now, the chip on the smart card can store data such as your name, social security number, your date of birth, and even a PIN. Okay, so there is for security, um, there is for security devices. Oh, you have to, when you go to the building, you just, um, you type on, you just put it on it. Let me show you a picture so that you don't imagine too much. Smart cards, okay? So this is a good example of a smart card okay yes this is a smart card okay so by the time you just you put that on it it's going to read it and it will give you entrance to a building okay and there are lots there are lots of smart cards lots of them this is another smart card you can see this this uh, wi-fi symbol on it and there are lots of them as well okay now, if the card is in the wallet or pocket and the owner of the card walks to the sketchy um, gate, the readers on either side of the gate quickly scans the, the data stored on it or if, a, if there's a tag on it, right, it is being seen and then access will be allowed. Fiscal token. This is fiscal token. Now, fiscal token is a form of authentication, right? Now, now users can interact with a login system used to improve that the user has possession of the token. Now, what does it mean? It has an internal clock. So, whenever a PIN is entered, and they are used for banking transactions, really, for banking transactions, but also to log in in banks. Okay, you see them with that fiscal token, they will hang it, they will hang it within themselves, and you have to use it to type in that PIN to because it changes. Anytime you have been logged out, you have to type in another PIN. Okay, now. Now, when you enter a PIN and other application details are entered, then a one-time password is generated. The OTP is now shown on the small screen. The code changes, like I said, on a regular basis, and it's I think it's valid. Some is 30 seconds, some is less than one minute. Okay? Now, let's use banking as an example. When you log into your internet banking, right, and you want to carry out a transaction, the moment you enter your PIN, 
a one-time password is then shown on your fiscal token now your fiscal token is going to be linked with your bank right then a one-time password is going to be shown on that device screen which is usually eight digits and what happens the customer will now go into that transactional page and type in that code then it will give them access in two ways if you want to log into your bank account and you have the fiscal token you have to type in once you type in your username and password it's going to send you a one-time password on that fiscal token then you have to put that uh, otp into uh, in it before it gets you access to your account so there are, there are so many ways this can work okay then uh this is not this also another uh fiscal token so we have examples of multi-factor authentications a disconnected fiscal token right which is that other one then a connected fiscal token you've disconnected the first one connected the second one which has needs a one-time password directly to a computer or um, to a usb connector okay electronic token now these are software installed on a user device such as a smartphone so suppose the user wishes to log on to a website using their tablet computer this website will require the electronic token to be used to authenticate the user and that is what even google is using to call it two-factor authentication it's an electronic token so anytime you're logging in you must right if you enable it you have to put in right that code to be able to get access is eight there are eight like there are eight um numbers you have to put in right i think there are eight or about you have to put in and then you gain access to it okay so this will just help you in your reading so if you don't have to just it's not everything you just have to read. okay of course like i said you have already installed this electronic token app uh, for google google one is google authenticator we call it google authenticator okay okay finally um let's look at this one as well anti-malware software okay although you see this is also in chapter eight i've talked about it as well in chapter eight um we are running your antivirus software we are just constantly checking for virus attacks okay in fact they check softwares on files before they are loaded on the computer uh, the character we call realistic checking it will check everything on your system to check any possible viruses and if there's any viruses any files or softwares that are found infected then a, a quality is carried out which allows the virus to be deleted, allows the users to make decisions about the deletion. Sometimes you may even have to delete the software uh, or the program as well. Okay, let's look at electronic conferencing. It's a long one, but um, I wanted to break it down into bits, but I just feel like just going everything straight. So you can just always pause it and um, continue from where you've stopped. Electronic conferencing. Let's look at it. In electronic conferencing, we have three, and I'm just going to go straight to the point of this. We have the video conferencing, audio conferencing, and web conferencing. Okay. Now, for video conferencing, it's a communication method that uses both video and sound. And usually, for video conferencing, it's a substitute to face to face. Okay, people will have Zoom meetings, you know of your Zoom, Google Meet meetings, you have them. Between numbers of people who can be in different parts. There are people who can be in different countries and they are connected to the same meeting in real time. Okay, now there are basic hardware that are needed. Webcam, a large monitor screen or television screen, microphones, speakers. Okay, usually when you never you want to have that kind of virtual meeting, you have to agree on a time and date. 
the video conferencing setup needs to be checked before the meeting goes live. Webcam will need to be placed to be on place in the correct position. Microphone as well. Um, of course, you have to. Uh, there's somebody have to be on ground to ensure that you know in both parties they can hear each other as much as possible. Like I said, we are not just we are not going into um, into details because we just want to look at the main part. Now, most time you might need a webcam or a microphone software driver that ensures that this webcam and microphone transmits the image and sound to the world other delegates. What are the advantages of video conferencing? As people in their own building, it is more easier to assess important information or bring in experts at key parts of the conference. It is possible to hold conferences at short notice, even though you are in a different country. Okay? Not traveling physically to meetings reduces cost. What are the costs? Traveling costs. Pay Imagine if you have you need to have to have a seminar talk in um in Stockholm. That will save you traveling costs, airplane co um, flight cost, flight ticket cost, accommodation, hotel accommodation, right? And even taking people away from their own because they actually have works to do, right? So um it, it helps, right? That's a very good advantage. Okay, um, also it's better to use it than have delegates travel to potentially unsafe environment. Like for example, Sudan, right? And you want to have delegations with these parties, you can have them online, right? Instead of traveling in person and um, maybe a bomb or something miss you on the way, you know. It is also better for the environment because less travel, less pollution, okay? It connects people in an organization who might who might be otherwise left out. For example, people who are not based on the headquarters, it can also connect them as well. Okay, another disadvantage is there is potential time lag. If your network is not strong, you discover there is that lag. Okay, somebody must have said something, that might have said something, and then that's where you're not hearing what the person has said. Images can be checked due to poor internet connection, you cannot be able to see the person. Um, there could be that poor and uh, network performance or poor bandwidth. Sometimes in Zoom, you see that the network is unstable. Okay, and it is expensive to set up. Okay, both the hardware and softwares are expensive to purchase. Okay, unless another thing is time zone. Okay, there's always a problem if the delegate is in another country, for example, South Korea. Probably when Korea is at night, that's when you are in the afternoon, right? So there's always going to be that time zone differences, okay? And not everybody knows how to use Zoom, um, Google Meet, it's when you have to train people how to use, and these are the two uh, most popular um, video conferencing. So you have to train people on how to use it, which can be costly and time consuming, okay? Now, the whole system relies on good internet connection. So it means that if your internet connection is not strong, you will have um, network, um, a network, um, a poor bandwidth, um, poor internet connection, um, the signal strength. If, so if it breaks down, uh, it, can be, if, it can be unstable. That's the whole idea. So this thing works with the good. So if there's no good internet connection, you might not be able to see the person in real time. There's lagging. There's a lot of things on it, which is a great disadvantage. Okay. Audio conferencing. Now, probably in Zoom, you guys have probably seen what we call um, a phone number. So you can either join through the Zoom link or through the phone number. That's if you're based in the US. Okay, I think it works in the US and the UK. Okay, then we have Google Voice as well, where you can hold meetings through a phone call. Okay, although for Google Voice, it's available in the US, in the UK, in Switzerland, in Belgium, in Canada. Um, you can check it out on the website, voice.google.com. So you check it out, right? So, so for audio conferencing, 
refers to meetings held between people using what audio blue jeans are good examples of audio conferencing okay even google meet has it but although google meet is you don't really need a phone number for it though no? you need a pin okay so audio conferencing can be done over what a standard telephone network right now we'll talk about the um audio conferencing although that one is a modern electronic audio conferencing but talking about the audio conference i'm talking about joining two telephone that uses telephone network okay now the organizer of the, the organizer of the phone conference is given two pins by the phone company one pin is for the organizer and the other pin is for what the participants now the organizer, the organizer is going to contact the participants inform them of their pin and then again inform them of what the date and time of what the phone conference then when the phone conference is about to start okay the organizer will dial uh, the conference phone number and once they are connected then you have to put in what that pin okay um so this is a picture of it right here where you see a lot of people that are calling so when the, when the meeting is about to start to call and then um everybody can be able to join in into it um on the phone so what what do you need you need a standard an internet phone a google voice like i said um, a standard phone um, an external microphone or speaker and of course a computer and um, web conferencing what we call webinars or webca web webcast okay that simply means um which is what we are using now okay zoom is also a, a video conferencing and also a webinar okay there are multiple groups now for webinars that means meetings held over the web okay so multiple computers are used in this system all connected over the internet it's the same thing as video conferencing it is carried out in real time and allows the following types of videos to take place presentation online education business meetings etc etc okay um some of the main features is slide presentation host can share live presentations um the, the use of um whiteboards right you can transmit images or video um, using the webcam um, and then again you can also play videos online for everyone to be able to see what you're talking about and i think with this i think with this um